Today I am going to be recapping A Good Girl's Guide to Murder by Holly Jackson. This is the start of a YA thriller mystery series. It's one of my all-time favourites and I'm really glad that I get to discuss this with you and tell you all about the plot. There will obviously be spoilers. I am doing a full spoiler recap so if you don't want any spoilers for this series please click off of this video now. I will however only be spoiling the first book. I'll talk you through the entire thing, introduce you to all the characters and then we will stop and I'll be back with another video for book two in the series. This series is also being turned into a TV show very soon. I don't know when it's releasing. I don't think it's got an official release date yet, but I'm very excited. I hope you guys are too. A quick disclaimer, I guess, or info before I begin. The UK and the US editions of this book are set in different places. So the UK edition is set in Buckinghamshire in the UK and the US edition is not. I don't actually know where the US edition is set, but it's not in Buckinghamshire. It's set over in America. So the place names in this recap may May not make sense to you. They may not be the exact same because I am using the UK place names because I read the UK edition, it's where it was originally set, and I won't be including any US place names. However, the entire plot will still be exactly the same. They haven't changed anything else as far as I'm aware, just the location for some reason. So without further ado, let me introduce you to the characters of A Good Girl's Guide to Murder. I've only included the most relevant characters here on my murder board. There are more that become more relevant later on in the series, but I didn't want to overwhelm anyone and I've only got so much space on my wall. So starting off we have Pip who is our main character. She is I think 17 years old and she is doing a school project on the disappearance of Andy Bell. Pip also has a dog called Barney. I really shouldn't skip over him. He is adorable and the best boy. Andy Bell disappeared five years ago. I'll go more into that in a bit. She was dating someone called Sal Singh, who unfortunately five years ago also took his own life and the police decided that Sal was responsible for Andy's murder and disappearance, or disappearance and then murder. However, her body was never found. Sal has a brother called Ravi, who is lovely. Andy has a sister called Becca. Also here we have Pip's best friend, Kara. Kara Ward, whose sister is called Naomi and their dad, is called Elliot. He is a school teacher at Pip's school. Down here we have Nat and here we have Max Hastings who we hate. Nat, Sal, Andy, Max and Naomi were all in the same school year together and they all went to the same school. And then up here we have Stanley Forbes and you may be wondering why <laughs> I have a picture of Finnick O'Dare up here and it's because someone fan cast him as Stanley and I don't necessarily agree that that's the best casting but I really like Sam Claflin so <laughs> include this picture here. I got all of these pictures from IMDB, apart from obviously Barney, and I think I've got the casting right, so all of these people have been cast in the TV show, apart from Sam Claflin as Stanley. So now let's get into the plot. Okay, so starting off, I want to go over the events of five years earlier, before the start of the book because it's really important background information. I've already touched upon this very briefly, but just to reiterate, one evening Andy Bell disappeared. No one knows what happened to her, her body has never been discovered, so she could actually still be alive. Sal was Andy's boyfriend and Sal was suspected of murdering Andy and everyone was worried that he was about to be questioned. He was later found deceased in the woods just outside of town because he took his own life. It's probably important to note here that he was a suspect because allegedly he asked all of his friends and again his friends were Max Hastings, Naomi Ward, he allegedly asked them to lie about his alibi. He supposedly told them to tell the police that Sal was over at Max's house until 12 15 a.m but the friends are now saying that Sal actually left the house two hours before that and it's theorized that because Sal's alibi was falling apart and his friends were about to turn him in he decided to take his own life because of the guilt of murdering his girlfriend. So he sent his dad a text message to say that he did murder Andy, but he didn't say anything about where the body was buried, and he took his own life in the woods. And so the police, thinking that they had all of the evidence they needed, decided to close the case. I also want to mention here that Nat's brother was on the police force at the time, but he doesn't get his own picture because it's not necessary right now. Okay, and now we're caught up to the very start of the first book where we meet our main character, Pip. So Pip has decided that all of that stuff that happened five years ago doesn't really add up and she is kind of like an amateur sleuth and she wants to clear Sal's name because she doesn't think he did it. She thinks that someone else framed Sal, which then either caused him to take his own life due to threats or something or maybe murdered Sal themselves. She is determined to prove it and her teachers are like this is kind of a weird end of year project but 
you do you, go ahead and we'll give you the credit if you do it properly. And so Pip gets going on researching the case. The first thing that Pip decides that she has to do is go and speak to Sal's younger brother. His name is Ravi and he is a couple of years older than Pip, I think. He has already left school and he is kind of still staying in the village because of his parents. They are still very hung up on losing their son, obviously. The whole family is still grieving, especially because they don't believe that their son or brother was a murderer. So Ravi is still living in Little Kilton with his parents. And when Pip first goes to speak to him, he's kind of like, this is a stupid idea. We're trying to move on from this. We really need to move on from this. At the moment, people are still like egging our house and accusing us of things. So by doing research, Pip, you're going to drag everyone back into this, create a whole load of drama and really not help the situation. So Pip, thinking the stuff with Ravi is a non-starter, decides to go on Facebook, <laughs> because what else are you gonna do when you're a teenage girl of this era? Pip looks through Andy's Facebook page and figures out who her closest friends were back then. Their names were Emma and Chloe, and they have both since left the village, so Pip starts figuring out how to get in touch with them. Pip also goes to speak to Stanley, who is a journalist in Little Kilton for the local newspaper, probably like the Bucks Free Press or something. He doesn't provide much new information, but he does let slip that Andy received a death threat the week that she disappeared. Pip and Ravi bump into each other at the supermarket and she again feels sorry for him, tries to stick up for him and it doesn't go down too well, so she then goes and apologises and the two get talking. They chat a little bit about Sal and Ravi is kind of reminiscing about his brother and saying to Pip that his brother was not a murderer. They also talk a little bit about Elliot Ward, who again is Kara's father and Kara is Pip's best friend. So Elliot is kind of like a second father to Pip and Kara and Naomi are kind of like her sisters. Pip, knowing that Naomi was friends with Sal, decides to use their closeness as an in and chats to her about what happened that night. Naomi says there was a gathering at Max Hastings' house the night that Andy disappeared. Naomi says that Sal left the gathering, I suppose, at about 10.30 p.m. And then Sal's father said that Sal returned home at 12.50 a.m. So that leaves over a two hour window in which he could have committed the crime. Pip then decides that she needs to go and talk to Max who was hosting the party. Max is an annoying prick and doesn't really give much away. Pip asks Max some questions about what happened that evening, if Sal was saying anything a bit dodgy, if he spoke about Andy, and Max says he didn't really say anything about Andy that evening, but Naomi disagrees and said that Sal did. So their stories aren't adding up immediately. Pip is really doing the rounds and she goes to talk to Elliot Ward about Sal as well because Elliot Ward, I think he's the history teacher at the school. The subject that he teaches really isn't important, but Mr. Ward, Elliot Ward says that Sal was really intelligent and he was going to go to Oxford University. And that's basically, if you don't know, you probably do know, it's the equivalent of like Yale and Harvard over here in the UK. Pip also asks Elliot if he knew Andy at the time as well, because he was at the school back then, obviously. Elliot says he didn't know Andy at all. Ravi, bless him, then comes up to Pip and says that he wants to help with the investigation entirely. He wants to be all in. He wants to see all of the evidence that Pip has gathered so far. And in return, he brings along Sal's old mobile phone. They go through the phone together and they find a text from Sal to Andy which says I'm not talking to you until you've stopped. They also find the confession text on there as well. That's been left on there by the police who have obviously handed the phone back now because the case has been closed and they think that this confessional text doesn't match Sal's usual writing style going by his other text messages. The grammar just doesn't match. They also find a note on the mobile phone as well which was made the week that Andy went missing and it contains a number plate. Pip finally gets into contact with Emma and Chloe and his friends and they both pretty much say that Andy was really cruel. It doesn't sound like they liked her very much but because teenage girls they're gonna put up with their best friend, popular friend being a horrible person. They also imply that Andy didn't get on very well with her father, Jason Bell. And then it comes to light that Andy may have been in a relationship with a secret older guy capitals on S-O-G. Taking a break from the investigation, Pip and her friends decide to go camping because again, they're teenagers and Pip's life can't revolve around this investigation, although it does start to. Something scares them in the middle of the night and they go running off. And when they get back, Pip finds a note in her sleeping bag. This note tells her that she needs to stop investigating. Pip then starts to suspect Naomi because she's acting really weird. She also suspects Elliot Ward a little bit. To be fair, she's got a list of like 10 people who are her main suspects and she 
she flip-flops between them at various points throughout the book, but she suspects Elliot Ward because she goes to talk to him and then he does admit that Andy Bell probably didn't like him very much because Elliot reported Andy to Jason Bell for bullying and Pip is fine with this explanation, like, it makes sense. Especially now that she has learned from Andy's friends that Andy was not the nicest person. Pip then goes to talk to Naomi again and talks to her about the bullying and it turns out that Andy was bullying a girl called Nat De Silva. Nat was later charged with ABH at university and had to drop out and so she is now back in the village. Pip goes to speak to Nat who now has an ankle bracelet because she's been in trouble with the police. She is still incredibly angry about everything that happened in her school years. Nat really doesn't want to speak to Pip. She doesn't like that she's investigating this and she doesn't want to bring up the ghosts of her past, I suppose. However, Nat does admit that she put a threatening note in Andy's locker because Andy was horrible to her. Basically, what Andy did was post a video of Nat topless on the internet and the whole school saw it. Andy also threatened to tell everyone that she had been sleeping with Daniel De Silva, who is Nat's older brother and at the time already in the police force. So that wouldn't have gone down well if he was sleeping with a student. This is enough for Pip to put Daniel on the suspect list because he would have had a motive to kill Andy. Pip receives a transcript of Sal's interview with the police because it's public information. It does make Sal look a little bit dodgy because he refuses to tell the police why he and Andy were arguing that week. Pip then goes to speak to Becca Bell, who is Andy's sister. Becca is currently working for the newspaper, the same newspaper that Stanley Forbes is working for. Pip tries to ask Becca about her and Andy's relationship with their father Jason but Becca refuses to talk about him which I think is pretty telling in itself. Pip isn't really getting anywhere with Becca at all so she goes to speak to Becca's friend Jess and Jess is quite open with talking about Jason Bell because obviously she's not going to get in trouble. Jess says that Jason was absolutely awful to his two children. He basically pitted Andy and Becca against each other. Jess also says that she and Becca went to a house party back in the day and afterwards Jess went with Becca to buy the morning after pill which means that Becca slept with someone at the party but she refused to tell Jess who which to me implies that it wasn't the best experience. Pip obviously has some more questions and so she goes back to speak to Max Hastings and she asks him a little bit about the party and Pip spots a topless photo of Andy in Max's room. Max says he found it at the school and decided to keep it which is really freaking creepy and again we hate Max, we really don't like Max. Pip then asks Max if he was seeing Andy and he completely denies it. Pip kind of gets an inkling that Andy was dealing drugs to fellow students so Pip herself attends a student house party to try to figure out who the suppliers are. At the party Pip is hit on by a pervy guy, I can't remember his name, it's not important, but she does get the information that she wanted and she knows now that the dealer hangs around the train station in Little Kilton and does his dealings there. Pip goes to the station and kind of spies on the dealer whose name is Howie. She decides that it's a really good idea to follow him home, which I disagree with and she does notice that Howie's number plate does match the note that was on Sal's phone. Ravi arrives and Pip decides to enter Howie's house which again is a really bad idea. Pip kind of interrogates Howie and gets him to talk. Howie admits that he did supply Andy with drugs for dealing and also maybe Max Hastings. Apparently Max Hastings used to buy Rehypnol. Howie admits that he used to contact Andy on her burner phone so Pip is determined to then go and find that phone because it's probably got a lot of information that she needs. Pip on her own phone receives a message telling her that she needs to stop. This one is a lot ruder than the previous note that she found which kind of implies that the person who is asking her to stop is getting more desperate. Pip then decides that it's a really good idea to break into the Bell house. Ravi goes with her because he doesn't want her to be alone. Pip finds the spare key and is able to enter the house without actually breaking in. Unfortunately when they are in the house and are searching and is room, Becca returns home. So Pip and Ravi have to hide in the cupboard. Becca doesn't see them and in the end Pip and Ravi do manage to find something. They don't find the burner phone but they do find Andy's old school planner. They leave the house and they have a look through it. They see a few doodles and writings and things that could be code. They find a little note saying IV or Roman numeral 4. They figure that this could relate to a hotel which is a couple of towns over. There's also a phone number which has been scribbled out quite intensely. They can read the first 
first few numbers, but the last ones are very difficult to read, so they can't quite figure that out. So Pip and Ravi then head to Little Chalfont, where this hotel is. It's called the Ivy Hotel, so IV equals IV. They speak to the owner, who unfortunately has Alzheimer's, and the owner does get very upset when she is questioned because she can't remember anything. But she does kind of seem to confirm that she has seen Andy before. Pip notices that the decor in the hotel matches that in the photo that is in Max's room. Pip then contacts Emma and Chloe again and asks if back in the day anyone ever had their drinks spiked at the house parties that they were attending. It's confirmed that people did have their drinks spiked unfortunately and Pip thinks it must be Max, like it must be. Pip does some more research and she finds that Max has a secret Facebook profile. So on his normal one, he posts like standard things that he's fine with his family seeing. But on this other one, which is named Nancy Tango Tits because he is classy. And when Pip gains access to it by using Naomi's login. Pip finds a ton of photos from various house parties, lots of photos of Max drunk. He obviously didn't want his parents seeing these. On this Facebook profile, Pip scrolls down and finds a bunch of photos from the night that Andy disappeared. She's scrolling through them and she thinks some of them in particular look a little bit odd. They're of the friends, so Max, Naomi. But then who took the photos? Because all the friends are in them. And Pip realises that it must have been Sal who took the photos, meaning Sal was still at the house gathering past midnight when the photos were taken in order to be able to take them and he didn't leave at 10.30 like the others are saying. Pip and Ravi then decide to do a little bit of investigating and they decide that they should retrace Sal's supposed steps as if he left the gathering at 12.10 a.m. like he originally said. They retrace his steps. In the end, they figure out that Sal could not have left the party at 12.10 a.m and then murder Andy and then get home at 12.50 a.m., which is confirmed by Sal's dad, because there's just not enough time. Even going the absolute fastest they could, Pip and Ravi couldn't recreate leaving the house, walking along the road, murdering Andy, getting rid of the body, and then getting home in that time period. This means that Sal was definitely innocent. Pip then goes over to the ward house again, and Naomi and Max are both there. They admit to Pip that they did lie to the police about what time Sal left the house. They say this is because they received a threatening message themselves. It turns out that Max and Naomi were previously involved in a hit and run accident, and whoever sent that message somehow knew about it, and threatened to tell the police unless the friends lied about Sal. So what basically happened during this hit and run is they were over in Amersham, I think, and they had to get home to Little Kilton and they were driving along a dark road. Max was driving and he had also been drinking and he hit a man. The man didn't die, but he was severely injured and I believe became disabled after the accident, but the friends have never told anyone because it would ruin their lives. Never mind about the man that they hit. So Max continues to be a prick. Pip's suspect list is getting longer so it now consists of Howie, Max, Jason Bell, Daniel and Nat De Silva, and Elliot Ward. Pip returns home and she finds that someone has broken into her bedroom. She finds another note. This one says, you need to stop this, comma, Pippa. A couple of days later, Naomi Ward then breaks her phone accidentally and she uses her father's spare one. This is important later. Pip then finds a final note in her locker, which seems to be a final warning. Pip bumps into Nat in the school hallway because Nat was trying to apply for a job at the school, but unfortunately the school won't employ anyone with a criminal record because Nat has been violent again. She was arrested for ABH. Pip goes back to talk to Becca and his sister. Becca tells Pip that she's currently working on a news piece about why it's a really bad idea to renovate the abandoned farmhouse on the outskirts of town. Pip asks Becca about the burner phone and his burner phone and Becca says no one knows where this burner phone is. She does say that Daniel De Silva, Nat's brother, was involved in the initial search in this case and he searched the house. Becca tells Pip that Dan shouldn't be a suspect because he's actually really close with Jason Bell. Alarm bells start ringing and <laughs> alarm bells and so Pip goes to a town meeting where the public are able to talk to local officers and council members about their concerns. A lot of them are very Karen concerns, shall we say, about people loitering on benches and things. So Pip has to go through all of that before she gets a chance to speak to Daniel, who is there. His wife Kim is there too. Daniel clearly doesn't really want to talk to Pip, and Kim, Daniel's wife, seems to imply that Daniel may have a thing for young girls, which is gross. What is wrong with people in this village? Pip then takes her dog Barney for a walk and he goes missing. Pip and her family go searching for Barney and he's just not showing up. It's very unlike him to run away and he knows the woods really well so he could have just traveled back home himself, but he didn't, so Pip is distraught. Pip then receives a message from an unknown number saying that if she wants her dog back, 
she will have to destroy all of the evidence that she has gathered on this case so far. So Pip will need to destroy all of her handwritten notes and her laptop and everything in order to get Barney back. Of course, Pip has no problem with that. She just wants her dog back. So she uh, destroys her laptop and she still doesn't have Barney. A little while later, it turns out that Barney has been found drowned in the river. It's absolutely heartbreaking. I don't like talking about it. So we're just gonna move on because it's awful. Ravi comes over to talk to Pip because obviously she's not doing very well after all of that. Ravi says he understands that this happened and obviously she had to destroy her research in order to try to save Barney. However, Pip being Pip, she has backed up her research and now both Ravi and Pip are even more determined to solve the case. Naomi calls up Pip to send her condolences about Barney. She's obviously calling from Elliot Ward's burner phone because again, her phone broke. And Pip notices that this number that Naomi is calling from is the same one in Andy's planner. Pip heads straight over to the Ward house and is completely ready to blame Naomi. But then she is reminded that Naomi is using Elliot Ward's spare phone. Pip does like a complete stop and is like, oh my God. And so she goes to check out the printer in the Ward house and finds through the history that it did print out one of the notes, the one that was left in Pip's locker. So now Elliot Ward is the number one suspect. How could he not be at this point? So Ravi and Pip figure that Elliot Ward probably isn't out tutoring every night like he says he is. And they theorize that he could actually be visiting Andy if she is still alive three times a week. And they think that he has Andy locked up somewhere. Pip puts her own phone in Elliot Ward's car in the back and kind of hides it. And she turns the tracker on so that she can track him. And he goes to another little village called Wendover, which is where the Ward family used to live. Pip thinks that Elliot Ward maybe didn't sell the house in Wendover and that's where he's keeping Andy. Pip is still putting all of this together, but she does think that Elliot Ward may well know about this hit and run that Naomi and Max were involved in because he probably read Naomi's journal and she probably wrote something down in there to kind of get her feelings out. And Elliot, may have just been figuring out whether his daughter was okay or he might have been being nosy. And so he probably used the information from that hit and run in the notebook to blackmail his own daughter. So Pip heads straight over to the Wendover house and she goes in because she just does not care. Elliot Ward is there in the house and Pip confronts him. He admits that he was sleeping with Andy Bell when she was still in high school. He tells Pip that he was trying to break things off with Andy and get her to stop, but she tried blackmailing him to get him to keep things going. They had a massive argument the night that she disappeared over exactly that topic and Andy tripped and hit her head on Elliot Ward's desk. He tried to look after her apparently, but then she left very quickly and tried to head home by herself. Elliot then admits that he panicked completely when he heard that Andy Bell was missing and he didn't know what to do. He didn't want to go to prison for murder or manslaughter. And so he killed Sao Singh to frame him so that Elliot didn't get into trouble. Later on though, and this is where it turns into a whole mess, Elliot says that he saw Andy walking along the road one evening. He picked her up and she seemed really confused and didn't really seem to remember her own name. So he drove her to the house in Wendover and locked her in the attic. And that is where Andy Bell currently still is. The police are just starting to arrive at this point because Pip called them because obviously she's not gonna go into this house without a plan. But Pip races upstairs to the attic to find Andy. And this is where it all goes a bit wrong again because she does find a girl there, but this girl is not Andy Bell. Elliot is arrested. Pip goes to talk to Ravi. Pip learns that the girl in the attic was actually a young woman from Milton Keynes, which is a few miles north of Wendover. And this young woman is really confused and now believes that she is Andy because that is what Elliot has been telling her for five years. So she probably needs professional help right now. So Pip has managed to solve part of the case and Elliot Ward is now in prison, but she is no closer to finding out where Andy Bell actually is because it doesn't seem as though Elliot killed her. Pip has a strong, strong suspicion that Becca Bell was actually involved. And so she heads over there to confront her by herself which is a terrible idea. I wish Pip would stop doing this. So they're talking and Becca spikes Pip's drink. Pip doesn't realize what's happening, but she does get Becca to confess. Becca tells Pip that Andy did come home that night and Becca tries to tell Andy that Becca had been drugged and raped at a house party and it seemed as though Andy didn't care. So Becca being quite traumatized, got very angry with her older sister who is meant to be her protector, but instead was possibly a horrible person. Doesn't mean she had to die though. So so Becca got super angry and she and Andy argued. There was some pushing and shoving involved and Andy fell over and started convulsing. Becca didn't really know what to do. She completely froze and Andy eventually choked on her own vomit. Becca then put Andy's body in a septic tank at the abandoned farmhouse 
on the outskirts of town that she is doing the paper on. Becca then tries to kill Pip, but she can't actually do it in the end. Ravi and Pip's dad arrive in time, and both Becca and Max Hastings are arrested. At the end of the book, Pip gives a really lovely speech about Sal, and Ravi is very grateful that she has cleared Sal's name. So that's it, that's the entire plot of the book. I think I've gone into enough detail. If you've got any questions, let me know in the comments down below. It's all very intricate, so I tried to tell it in the easiest way to follow as possible. Basically, Max Hastings is the worst. First, Becca Bell is a traumatised young girl, but she did kind of kill her sister. But Elliot Ward is also quite horrible and should definitely not have been a school teacher. I forgot to say actually, he blamed all of this on the death of his wife. He said he was grieving her and that's why he got with a student, but it's not good enough, is it? So now where we're at at the end of the book is Stanley Forbes is still working for the newspaper, very important for book two. Ravi is happy and is together with Pip and his family are really happy because Sal's name has been cleared. Nat, I still don't think, has a job. Andy Bell's body has been found. Becca is in prison. Max Hastings is in jail, but I think he's out on bail and he probably should be in prison, but he's not because he's rich. And then these two are without parents because Elliot Ward is in jail and their mother is dead. So they're now left alone. So that's great. Well done, Elliot. That's it for my recap of A Good Girl's Guide to Murder. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, like I said, if you've got any questions, leave them in the comments down below. There will be spoilers down there. So be careful if you're scrolling. I'll do my best to answer them. I did reread this book very recently. So it's all fresh in my mind. I'll be back very soon with a recap of book two good girl bad blood if you've got any recap requests for me let me know in the comments down below as well i'll be quite happy to do those currently i have a few planned including the rest of the series and also the three body problem thank you so much for watching please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video and i'll talk to you in the next one bye